doctors have read it. What is the rarest disease you've ever encountered in your career? Patient admitted for something unrelated starts deteriorating for no discernible reason. Has some mild, generalized abdominal pain, but other than that, no specific symptoms. However, he keeps worsening to the point where he's barely hemodynamically stable. On the abdominal contrast CT, there is fluid everywhere. Organs pushed against the abdominal wall, just one enormous gray puddle from the top of his pelvis to his diaphragm. And then at some point there's a scribble of white pretty much smack dab in the middle of all of it. In this context, signifying active bleeding. It was shaped like the world's smallest firework pop, and it was nowhere close to any major vessel. Everyone was dumbfounded for a hot minute. It turned out to be a spontaneous, atraumatic rupture of the cystic artery. No surgeon in the building had ever seen one. Dude underwent embolization and made it out completely unscathed. I can only imagine how lucky you must feel after being diagnosed with something incredibly rare and still making it out without a problem. Huge props to the doctors here, and lucky guy. Story 2. Fibrodysplasia ossificans progressiva, FOP, a disease that calcifies soft tissue and turns it into bone. When I was a med student, our group's cadaver had this disease. During dissections, we would sometimes get poked by spiky pieces of bone in random areas of her body. Also had a spine that resembled a small turtle shell. I've heard of this in, like, passing before, never really thought about it, but this is a terrifying disease, no thank you. Also, terrifying to pronounce. Hope I got it right. Story 3. I diagnosed a patient with cancer of the parotid gland. It has an incidence of less than 1%. It went something like this. He came to me because he was having right jaw pain. I assessed him and nothing was really out of the ordinary. I thought he was having some TMJ because he had been dealing with some stress and he did have pain at the TM joint. A week later he came back with a Bell's palsy, which is a temporary paralysis of one side of the face. This can be caused by inflammation or a viral infection. So I asked the appropriate questions and he had some upper respiratory symptoms the week before. But something was off. So I palpated his jaw again and moved more medially toward his cheek. And he said it was painful midway on his cheek. That's where his parotid gland was. There was something there. Not a discernible mass, but something was off. That's when I ordered a CT scan and it was confirmed. I got him to a head slash neck specialist along with getting him to a cancer specialist. He's currently two years out and although he's missing some of his face due to surgery, he's doing surprisingly well and his spirits are great. Story 4. We had a patient once, a young girl, who was so sick that it broke our data analysis pipeline. When the code ingested a genome sequencing sample, it attempted to detect the chromosomal sex of the patient. It was using two metrics. The sample was considered female if it, one, lacked Y chromosome, and two, was heterozygous on X chromosome, implying there were two copies of it. Otherwise, the sample was considered male. This one sample registered as female on metric one, no Y chromosome, but male on metric two. Very little heterozygosity on X chromosome, which was not anticipated and resulted in our pipeline crashing. Upon investigation, it turned out that the parents of the poor girl were brother and sister. As a result, she had very little genetic variation throughout her genome, not just X chromosome, and was consequently very sick with a plethora of diseases typical for consanguineous births. This OP used some fancy words that hurt my brain. Heterozygosity and consanguineous? I only think I'm saying those right. They make sense in my head because I know the, the roots of them, I think. But still, never would have thought I would come across them. That aside though, parents being siblings. Yikes. That's, that's no good for the good old jean soup inside of you. I hope she's doing alright now. She did not choose that life. Story 5. Persistent Genital Arousal Disorder Having multiple climaxes a day at any time without any stimulation becomes quite bothersome and uncomfortable. Limits your daily activities and sleep is interrupted. Over time, patients can become very hopeless. It is remarkable the dissonance between the name and the obvious joke and the tremendous suffering these patients endure. Story 6. Geneticist here. I work in a pretty big hospital and we get hard to solve cases from all over the world. Some of the cases are so unique there's literally no name yet for the genetic disorder. So those would be the rarest, but for the sake of this thread I will discuss something that's not the rarest but is pretty rare, and one of the most interesting. Prater Willy or Angel Man Syndrome. These are two extremely different disorders that are both caused by the exact same genetic mutation. The only difference is if the mutation occurred in the paternal chromosome or the maternal chromosome. If it occurred on the maternal chromosome, you get Angel Man Syndrome, which typically results in a child being overly happy, laughing all the time with light eyes and hair color, but also severe intellectual and physical disabilities. If the mutation occurred on the paternal chromosome, you get Prater Willy Syndrome, which results in the child having excessive hunger and can literally eat themselves to death, but with only mild cognitive disability. These kids may go a very long time not getting diagnosed and will become quite obese. 
Bonus disorder if you're still here. Williams Syndrome. With this one, the affected individual has an extremely charismatic, outgoing, and fun cocktail party personality. They are cognitively impaired in most aspects except for speech, and have very unique facial features that are described as elf-like. Story 7. Maybe not the rarest, but saw a 4-5 to five year old patient with Lesch-Nyhan syndrome on my PEDS rotation in med school. It's an X-linked recessive disease that a quick Google search tells me affects about 1 in every 400,000 individuals. It's due to a mutation in an enzyme involved with DNA recycling. The thing all med students remember about it is, for whatever reason, these patients have a tendency to self-mutilate. My specific patient had to have a procedure to have all his teeth removed because he would terribly bite his arms unless he was physically restrained. I believe he had an older brother that went through the same ordeal. So sad, but definitely one of the more memorable cases from med school. It's always shocking when I hear things like this and it's like 1 in 400,000, because you think about it, that's... That's still a lot of people. That is way more than I would ever expect to have rare diseases. There are a lot of people on this earth though, so I guess that makes sense. But 1 in 400,000? That's pretty common for a rare thing. Story 8. I had a patient who presented with purple slash silver skin. He looked like a smurf and the silver surfer had a baby. However, he was in the ER for abdominal pain and was highly offended when I asked him about his skin pigmentation. My first impression from across the room was that he was severely hypoxic, and I was amazed that he was walking and talking. He made comments that made it appear he was a huge conspiracy theorist, so I was suspicious of colloidal silver toxicity. When I asked him about it, he shouted angrily, I don't take silver supplements anymore. After some prying, he said he took them to self-treat for a prion disease, which he self-diagnosed from the grape juice test where you spit out grape juice into a petri dish and a fungus grows out of it. At this point, I'm like, yeah, this patient is friggin' nuts. I'm pretty sure he listened to too much Alex Jones and as a result, permanently dyed his skin blue, a condition called Argyria. It is astonishing what people are willing to put in their bodies if they think it's good for them. I guess that can be said for things that are actually good for us too, so it's hard to make that distinction sometimes. That would be a very concerning skin tone to see, though. I would definitely see that and be like, I don't know what it is, I'm not a doctor, but that person is unwell. Story 9. Brazilian doctor here. I live in a really poor part of an already poor country. When I was in my pediatric internship, there was this baby with hepatomegaly, big liver. In my region, the first thing that you have to think about in these cases is a disease called Kala Azar, also known as black fever or visceral leishmaniasis. It is an endemic disease where there's a parasite transmitted by a mosquito that can infect people with compromised immune systems, like people with HIV and kids. This parasite infects the bone marrow and stimulates clinical signs of acute leukemia like chronic fever, spontaneous bruises, and bleeding. The patient develops anemia, leukopenia, low white blood cells, and low platelets. To compensate, some organs like liver and spleen take care of the bone marrow function to create new blood cells and thus get bigger. This disease is really common in my region but really rare in other parts, especially non-tropical countries like the US. Anyway, as I was saying, this baby girl about one year old was admitted to investigate an enlarged liver. But the catch was that she kept having those episodes of hypoactivity and sleepiness, and sometimes even faintings, that would then get better after she was being breastfed. We then checked and saw that she was having lots of hypoglycemia episodes. Her lab was normal, and she had no other clinical signs that would remind of Kala Azar, besides the enlarged liver. The patient had HERS disease, a genetic disorder that makes you produce less glycogen due to an enzyme defect. Never heard of it before meeting this patient, and I don't think I'll ever meet another. Interestingly enough, in this same time, I had a patient that was admitted with leukopenia, anemia, and low platelets that was also hospitalized to rule out Kala Azar, but he actually had Fanconi anemia, an also really rare genetic disease. In this one, the bone marrow slowly stops producing blood cells. Besides this, the patient also has kidney, facial, bones malformations, and overall physical underdevelopment. Props to the doctors, given their limited resources for actually figuring this one out, though. Like, don't get me wrong, props to most doctors, but, like, this is really impressive. I bet as a doctor it's actually kind of exciting when these things happen. Like a puzzle to solve, almost. Except the puzzle is also playing with someone's life, so, eh. On second thought, maybe not. Story 10. Neurologist here, and we see a lot of weird stuff. Autoimmune encephalitis, brain on fire, late onset familial neuromuscular diseases, rare presentations of cancer, or perineoplastic disorders. But one rare one sticks out for me. We had a patient who had come in with confusion and aphasia, trouble speaking and understanding. 
We got more of a workup and saw small strokes all over but in peculiar distributions, and not ones that would explain his findings. Along with it, we saw microbleeds all over superficial parts of his brain. Turns out he has what's called cerebral amyloid angiopathy-related inflammation. It's an extremely rare inflammatory subtype of stroke disorder that we still aren't totally sure what it is. It has similar amyloid deposition you see in Alzheimer's, deposited around vessels which makes them weak and prone to stroke and bleeding. It causes rapidly progressive dementia. I presented the case to our department, a large academic center, and most had never heard or seen it in their career. A couple of the stroke doctors were the only ones who knew about it, and they had never seen it in person. Really interesting case. Story 11. Rarity varies by discipline. I'm in general surgery, so I see things like fourniers and neck fasks pretty regularly, but I have never treated an ear infection in my whole career. Look, I'm gonna be real, there's a lot of words here. I don't know how to say them, man. You're just gonna have to go with me here. I'm gonna do my best. That said, strangest presentation for me so far was a gentleman who had had an entire flux procedure on his stomach and esophagus. Nissen funduplication with a hiatal hernia repair. Then had a recurrence and got a redo which required a procedure to lengthen part of his stomach. Colus gastroplasty. After that procedure, you have a staple line in your stomach. His hiatal hernia recurred again, bringing his stomach back into his chest, and he formed a connection between his stomach and the sac surrounding his heart. He presented to the emergency department dying, because the gas and stomach contents could get into his pericardium but not out, and his heart couldn't expand adequately to pump. Mad props to the ED doc who figured it out and saved his life before shipping him to me. Alright, pericardium? I looked it up. It's like a sac around your heart, basically. So, gas and stomach contents getting there? Yeah, it sounds... sounds pretty bad. Definitely not a medical situation I would want to find myself in, ever. Once again, huge props to these doctors. Doing amazing work here. Story 12. I had a gentleman who came into the emergency room with extreme fatigue and was found to have very little blood in his body. I asked him what his medical conditions were and he told me he had polycythemia vera, which is a condition where the body makes too much blood. However, that's the opposite of what I saw. He told me he had been diagnosed years ago but had never needed treatment. At first I thought he was mistaken about his diagnosis. And then I was worried that his bone marrow might have gone into overdrive and eventually burned out. Eventually we discovered that he did have polycythemia vera, but had been slowly bleeding from an obscure GI bleed. A tiny blood vessel in his small intestine that would come in and out and bleed small amounts into his stool. In essence, his body was self-treating having too much blood by doing its own bloodletting for years. One week, he bled a bit too much and got out of whack and ended up in the hospital, which is where I met him. Crazy case. Another example where the body manages to find its own way to fix things. It's really amazing to me. Like the fact that your body can just be like, yeah, we have too much blood. Let's just get rid of some of it every now and then. And it just works? That's incredible. Story 13. A bunch. A. New onset Kreutzfeldt Jacob. Prion disease like mad cow. Patient had seen four neurologists and three psychiatrists and was told it was psychosomatic. Even the neurology resident at my institution initially thought that. But I insisted on admission and his attending got an MRI of his brain with classical finding for it. The family was devastated but so relieved they had a diagnosis. The patient passed away a short time later at home on hospice. B. Chronic granulomatous disease. Patient had a long hospitalization with chronic skin wound care. Bone marrow infection of histoplasmosis. D. Pulmonary cryptococcoma in an immunocompetent patient. Thought to be a malignancy and was resected to find out it wasn't. E. True delusional parasitosis. This was the single scariest thing I've seen in medicine. The patient was a successful business person with a family, and slowly the disease led to their life unraveling, and at least at the time I saw them, they didn't want treatment for it. So the delusion was strong. F. Topical but a true STEMI in a heart transplant patient with COVID-19. Occluded LAD. This is probably exceptionally rare. G. Adult onset stills disease in a patient with fevers and renal dysfunction. And probably many more I don't remember at the moment. Medicine is wild. Look, doctors, you're great. When it comes to telling stories and answering questions like this, you gotta dumb it down for us a little more. This post alone is probably going to be the result of a hundred thousand Google searches. And if you made it through all those and know what all of them are, congratulations, I'm gonna give you your doctor's license now. I don't even know what it is. Is it a license? Maybe. Story 14. Pediatric infectious disease doc in middle America at the time. Had an 18-month-old kiddo come into the hospital with fevers, like 104 Fahrenheit, 40 degrees Celsius spikes two to three times daily. Also had a gray skin tone, huge spleen and liver. This was the kind of kid you could see from the door she was trying to die. Sweaty, lethargic. Labs showed she was severely pancytopenic, meaning her white cells, red cells, and platelets were all much lower than they should be. High inflammatory markers. 
Blood culture never grew anything. Bone marrow was done because there was concern for cancer, it didn't show any cancerous cells though, and actually showed all cell lines were dividing appropriately. Talking with the family for history. They're Azerbaijani. Baby was born in the US, but family went back to Azerbaijan for four months when she was a four-month-old child. She's only had her two-month vaccines. Looking at her growth chart after her return to the US, she's had very poor weight gain. Went from 97th percentile to 3rd percentile now. Mom says she's a picky eater. Takes pretty much milk as a main food source, not at adequate nutrition for a toddler. Couple days into their care, while I'm chatting up with the family trying to figure out what we're missing, they get a call from grandma back in Azerbaijan. She's an old, uneducated lady who lives on a farm with her husband. She's worried about the baby. She tells the family, Tell the doctors she sounds like she has a sickness we here call leishmaniasis. Finish up with the family. Call the pathologist, ask them to look at the bone marrow again, but this time look for possible parasitic infection, with concern for leishmaniasis. They say okay. Call me back and ask me to come take a look. Scan through the bone marrow and find some macrophages, cells that eat up germs, and sure enough, right there in the cytoplasm of each macrophage, you can see 10 to 15 of the little devils. Sent the sample off to CDC for confirmation, but it was classical visceral leishmaniasis. Start liposomal amphotericin B. Normally a medicine we use to treat fungi, but also unalives this parasite. Within one dose, bam. Fevers are gone. She completed her course and I saw her in follow-up. Cell lines all recovered. Liver and spleen dropped to normal size and she even started eating normal food. Turns out if your spleen is filling up your whole abdomen, you have a hard time eating without it making you nauseous. And drinking is less problematic. Grandma coming in with the clutch. Like, that's actually incredible, although it makes sense if it's more common from that area if it's a parasite, for sure. Definitely think I said it wrong, too. Might be leishmaniasis. Look, I... I don't know. Words are hard. Doctor word make brain go off. And because brain go off, I'm gonna have to stop here. That being said, I have no doubt that you learned something from watching this video, so good for you. You're now a little bit smarter and wiser about the world. I also hope you just enjoyed it, and I also hope you have a wonderful day or night wherever you are. And I'll see you in the next one.